Welcome, everybody. My name is Scott Spitzer. I do strategic business development for ServiceNow's federal civilian group. Um, with me is Ben Prime, and we'll talk about him here in a minute. Uh, it's nice seeing everybody dressed up again, you know. I, I came in this morning for a breakfast meeting, and one of the executives of ServiceNow Federal came up to me and said, Scott, I've never seen you in a tie. I said, well, I've been here three years, and I've never worn one. So, yeah, that kind of worked out good. It was, it was so positive. I went and got my shoes polished up at the guy up there. So things work out good. But um, today we're here uh, to go through a case study called Challenges of the Digital Status Quo, One Agency's Approach to CDM. ServiceNow is presently in discussions with multiple agencies on utilizing ServiceNow in support of the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program. In the next 20 or 25 minutes, Ben Prime will show you how one agency utilized ServiceNow. This agency, and by the way, we will not be mentioning the agency's name at their request, so don't ask us, reimagined its approach to CDM in line with their overall modernization plans. The session will demonstrate how ServiceNow's integration and legacy systems and modern workflows enable the agency to combine several layers of the CDM process to work better, faster, and less expensive. Before we get started, there's a few CDM notables in the audience that I'd like to draw your attention to. The first one is Robert Gaelic, sitting right down here. Robert presently is the InfoSec lead for Federal Emergency Management Agency. Robert had designed an architecture to meet the key requirements of CDM utilizing ServiceNow. Daniel Joyner is also here on the front row. Uh, or DJ from CGI's Defend C program, and is their lead systems integration manager who integrated this traditional arc, this transitional architecture we're going to discuss. We also have Ivan Wu from Tanium here. We work very closely with him. He's the director of strategic accounts for Tanium. Ben Prime has spent 15 years as a cybersecurity analyst, senior solutions architect cyber regulations contributor. Most of Ben's focus has been on supporting the federal government and the federal government agencies in their cyber journey, architecture and transformational across the mission and the enterprise. And he has been involved in the CDM program like myself since the inception over 12 years ago. So without further ado, Ben, and we will have hopefully some time for questions at the end. Um, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. All right. Um, so quickly to get started, which since we only have 35 minutes, it's going to be a pretty tight, quick agenda, right? Just in case there's anybody in the audience who's uh, not familiar with CDM, we will like touch on the CDM basics. Some of us might have been doing it as long as I have, and it's kind of a little wishy-washy. We're really going to spend most of the time on uh, some of the foundations of technical capabilities, volume one, and then what was actually the cost savings methodology here and that simplicity. And then if we do have time for questions and answers, which if you want to, I can go fast, or we can always have a follow-up. Uh, in addition, there are uh, papers printed out in the back of our white paper outlining this also. So those are free to take if uh, you want content to leave with. Um, first things first is just in case we talk about anything or have any uh, questions that come up, safe harbor, if it's in the future, there's risk they may not be exact, so don't quote me on it. Present's present, but future's future. Um, so small to medium agency, uh, can't name any names, don't wanna give out exact, but I mean, how much would one agency could agency uh, save over that time, right? If an agent small to medium agency save 200K, would that be a good year for budgetary finance to reinvest or 400K? I mean, and think about what you would save, how much money is uh, your foundational layer of layer B costing you, right? What What is that cost to you today, right? How can you uh, take that cost impact and accelerate it? Uh, I don't think of too many people in here for the working for the government wouldn't want to save money and reallocate it to the next uh, programmatic budget to spend. Um, so that's the big thing. The that's a quick the opening why. See, I said we would get through these bullets really quickly. Uh, <laughs> CDM basics. Um, so first things first is definition. It's a dynamic approach to fortifying the cybersecurity of the federal government, right? That's the main leadership thing. It does come from the foundational layer at the bottom though, which is FISMA, you know, 
the reporting act and everything else, the law that we follow that provides all of the NIST as guidelines, right? And that gets into one big thing is CDM might be a funded program for agencies to comply with cybersecurity, but it follows the traditional NIST type architectures. We don't want to lose these, right? We we have a lot of operations going on and that's a good key foundation of the data we're going to roll up to the dashboard, but it is part of the mission and business process rolling up to the organization because it is cyber, it is risk. And we're trying to tie all those things together, strategic and tactical, right? Um, so as we go through there, I can't cover all of CDM, but if you're new, we can always have a conversation in the middle column on what's on the network, who's on the network, what's happening on the network, and then we can figure out how to protect your network. Um, and all the future ties, we could talk about binding operational directives to a blue in the face because they keep coming out like once a month now. But predominantly, we're just going to talk about the layers. Just And we'll get into the layers. So if anybody's not familiar with the CDM architecture of the tools layer A, uh, data aggregation layer B, dashboard layer C, and then ultimately reporting to DHS and D, that's really where we're going to focus our attention on layer B uh, and C. And then just to bring that out, CGI, because we mentioned DJ and Tyler, uh, CGI does have a booth out front. So uh, definitely stop in there if you want to get more technical. Uh, there you go, tech app. This is where we get into the depth and breadth of uh, the foundations of CDM, right? The big thing is CDM is that middle layer, the data aggregation layer, no matter which group you're on, it's an elastic database, right? That's the current architecture. We knew that there's a lot of data in the federal government. Elastic data storage is great for getting a lot of data. Um, there are pros to why we use relational databases. Relational databases have their place and everything. So when we look to different customers and we look to different uh, architectures and different implementations, there we do find that certain data points are missing because we're putting it into Elastic. So maybe not every tool is giving us the data structure we need to get the data out. Um, it is schema free. So there's probably a lot of extra data in there. And a lot of these Elastic searches pay for data content. Um, it can be good for the things like document orientation, but we don't have documents that we have to feed up directly into the CDM. ServiceNow, and where we'll really get into where relationships are important in the TechCap Volume 1 architecture, right, is, oh, well, that's the, sorry, my misclick. <laughs> that's elastic to me. You can throw a lot of data in there and you can organize the bits and pieces that you need, but there's still a dump of data. Um, and the ServiceNow is a structured database at its fundamental core. We still use elastic if we need to, to expand on certain principles, but at our true foundation, all the data coming in comes in and is structured. So when vulnerabilities come in, they attach to the asset. The asset is part of the FISMA boundary, things like that. We have the data integrity. So whoever is updating the data, whatever you're using in your environment, we know when and where it's updated and things like that from a database model, along with the transactional security. So CDM is a, and we can't talk about extras like zero trust, but CDM is a foundation of zero trust. So we're going to need to get into transactional security in the future along with this. This is more like uh, a library to me. When data comes into a library, the books get cataloged, they get uh, a number, they get a card, you know, when they're checked in, then when they're checked out, you can walk into any library and go get data. If you were to walk into somebody's garage and go try to find something in their garage, you would never find it, right? So those were one of the big key fundamentals of understanding what to do with the CDM model that we're about to talk about. Um, click. Oh. So why did we come to this data structure thought process? This is usually what I talked about with customers is if I go into a customer, they're going to tell me, oh, we have our asset inventory in one place and that's our master device system for um, architecture. Our users are collected in a totally different place. HR manages those and they're, they're an HR silo and people can't see their data because it's got social security numbers and other stuff. FISMA boundary, oh, the risk people don't want to talk to any of the other tools. They got their risk and reporting type stuff. So there is a lot of places where a lot of organizations have this data, right? But they're siloed from each other, right? Even in vulnerability and configuration security management, the scanning tool just gives the, the scanning team just gives their data to the asset inventory team, but there's no complete master device record, right? You need that foundation. 
Um, same thing we talked about with users. There might be other systems and uh, two-factor authentication, bring your own PIV CAT card. There might be a whole bunch of data points about the users in totally different siloed systems. Um, and then that list just keeps on growing and growing. Maybe you get some things connected. Like I wanna make sure my system boundaries are protecting my assets and I'm managing security incidents on them. But uh, my security guys have to go find the assets, right? And the person who owns them if I have a security incident. Maybe you've been bringing them in to write your POEMs and report up to whatever reporting mechanism you have to do, CSAM or internal. Um, and you've been bringing some of that data in so you have POEMs, but it might not be the whole complete architecture picture, right? So as you can see, we're starting to build out the diagram lines. Those, the reason I made the lines so big is because a lot of people don't have the lines connected, right? Because they're throwing data into that massive elastic database and they're trying to get those lines connected on a lot of the finite data because not everybody's perfect in the CDM dashboard is what I hear. I've completely seen it, but not everybody's perfect in the CDM dashboard and has everything connected. Um, so that's the one thing that ServiceNow does. Obviously we're here for ServiceNow. Hopefully everybody has a good premise of ServiceNow, but we already understand the, these types of data, right? We wanna be the master device record right off the bat. So we connect to application scanners, vulnerability scanners, stig SCAP compliance scanners. We have the CMDB and standard processes for getting all the hardware and software listed on them. Um, along with the risk and, and uh, cloud-based assets, everybody's going and sprawling. Um, and there's been some new orders and other things going on with not just your traditional devices, but now you also have to report up all your OT, IOT devices and starting to get into that. So how do you get into those things and have one central place? That's the one nice thing about ServiceNow is that central CMDB. And I'm way fast. <laughs> um, so the stack, right? This is where we get into CDM. So anybody who hasn't seen it, this is the ABCD that I've been talking about, right? Layer A is the tools layer. ServiceNow, out of box, we have hundreds and hundreds of integrations to the tools layer already, right? Uh, CMAS, that's your elastic and that's the dashboard. The one big thing that I noticed in the newer architectures, I'm using the old architecture on purpose. The one big thing that I've noticed in the newer architectures on the newer task orders is the left-hand bars are gone. If we go back to that NIST 839 and we're trying to talk about strategical risk and tactical risk and pushing up policy and compliance up and down, and I'll put it back there for a second in case I'm, that's the policies included risk scoring, the policy manager and orchestration and all this stuff that they had a vision for when, when the attachments came out even before tech cap volume one and two attachment end and all those other things th they were planning on having policy driven down right and now it's just happened to disappear i don't know if organizations are supposed to do that just manage it internally or there's no way to push it down because it's elastic and elastic isn't really a thing anymore because rsa archer used to be in that layer b used to be at the top and rsa archer is a grc tool so you have that vision but now it's elastic um so those are that, that's the biggest thing but what this one agency did what this one agency really wanted to know is what does it you really do here right <laughs> so the bobs um that's really i mean it's a data aggregation layer right it's i take the data from the tools and i give it to the dashboard right and then for some reason like what, what is that why are you doing that um, so what we came up with is a long-term vision goal. There was stages in between all this. Um, but ServiceNow as a middle layer, it's a dashboarding tool. So we don't need to like take it from the data aggregation layer and put it to the dashboard. We don't need to have any other collection tools come in uh, because we have all of the integrations. And even if it's something that's not in the store and you're using a tool that you wanna use, we have those data integration layers right there also where you can connect to your own applications and your own services and your own data stores and get that layer uh, A, your hardware, software, your master device record, your master user records on your trust, behave, cred from your PIV CAC servers or whatever else you wanna do and get that data up to the dashboard at the layer D, the federal dashboard and push it up because we're open API, those two things are supposed to be talking. So. This means no more elastic in the middle. You're using ServiceNow that you're already using.
to get your visibility, to get your dashboards, to get everything in one place, and then still have the interoperability to go to the top level. Foundation to CDM, sorry, first thing you have to comply with when you're a tools vendor is interoperability. You must be able to talk to the other dashboards, right? So the, I think that was probably one of the biggest things that was proven out in this architecture, going from the first phase, even into just getting the first bits of data up to the dashboard, is getting the data from the tools through ServiceNow, um, getting it transformed and getting it up to the dashboard. So we had interoperability. What this says though, is we still have GRC on our application. We're in Gartner Magic Quadrants and other Magic Quadrants for integrated risk management or governance risk and compliance. We can put those bars back in there. If there's push down governance like control objectives or like uh, BOD 1902, they just switched the critical assets must be patched in 15 days if they're public facing, right? So if you're pushing down governance policy like that, then you can be auditing yourself and dashboarding where you're not in compliance with any type of mandate that comes down to. And that's the main point of this. And I did go, I timed myself and I'm talking faster than I thought I would. But does anybody have any questions so far on this? No, no questions on this? Wow, I thought there would be like at least two or three. Is anybody in here thinking about what this could mean for their organization? You are. Are you thinking short-term, long-term? <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, so if we come back to what you guys would think about short-term, long-term, what, what are your major goals? Um, I would break these down in phases. Um, the effort took uh, less than a year to at least prove out the concept, um, closer to a half a year, if I'm not mistaken, six to eight months. So if you've been doing CDM as long as I have, it's taken you that long to get it up to the dashboard, getting this interoperability if you're already on service now and you've got your CMDB and, and you've got some of your assets in there, you can start this journey um, uh, without thinking of it as recreating the wheel and starting over in another 12 years. Just wanna let you know. So the big picture is I put a question mark in the beginning of this show of how much do you think you could save? So ballparking, not actual figures, but for a small to medium agency on that layer B, um, based on removing the complexities, gaining technology and cost, and improving the longevity of the CDM program. That's one of the biggest things with the new request for services coming out um, or the new RFI coming out is that you could probably in a small to medium agency see like 800K, 700, 800, 900K in your layer B is what we're estimating most small to medium agency on a yearly basis of replacing layer B and using service now as your data lake layer and your upper layer. Um, if you're in the higher range, we have customers who have 500 million vulnerable items in their CMDB alone. So, uh, cause we have gotten into that and some of the larger agencies and everything else have said, Hey, can we scale to this level? This is small, medium, right? Could you do this on big? Yes, we can hold the data for big. We have enterprise customers globally, largest federal customers. So we could easily scale to that area. Um, that was the last one. I thought there was going to be more questions. Any questions? Yes. Actually, Tim, I'll get you a second. That's going to be an interesting one. Um, we are in discussions, and this is where the roadmap slide, uh, the, the safe harbor slide comes in. We are discussing with our product management. Um, some of it is as a product vendor, we don't have access to the, the data mapping standards. In the new RFI, there is a note that says that the prime incumbent, if there's a new RFI DHS releases, the prime incumbent has to share certain things with the, with the software vendors. But we also go back to the group incumbents. So that's where DJ comes from. Like DJ's uh, CGI owns group C as the prime. So they have to facilitate uh, the federal agency or 
departments request for service to get the funding if they want to do it that way, and then architect this. But based on uh, how many, all the different primes being ServiceNow partner certified, all of them are, we're talking to all, all the primes on their contracts, they would be able to know what data is in ServiceNow and know what data needs to go up to the dashboard. So they can make that architectural shift and we would support them on that um, and things like that. Or definitely stop by CGI's booth and see how they could do it. CGI can actually, uh, they've got a demonstration capability of what they, what they built for this particular agency being demonstrated right here in the uh, in the lobby over here. So if you really want to see what it looks like, you can go over there. And then Tim. You, you talked about a phased approach, but I don't see anything about that. Can you talk some, like what do you consider phase one, phase two, key intricate pieces that you need to have established to be able to move forward, like CMTV? <laughs> Yes. Um, well, that's a very good question. Because when we talk in the service now world, we talk about the CMDB and we go into customers and we say, where's your maturity of the CMDB? That means different things to different customers. Some want horizontal. I just need a complete inventory of my assets. Some want vertical. I just want to, I really want to know my data centers, but we'll discover the IP phones later, right? In the CDM uh, thought process, what you really want to do is get a horizontal because if we go back to old attachment and there used to be a quote in there, 90% of your assets must be scanned in 70, uh, within the next 72 hours. If you don't know what a hundred percent is, how do you know what 90% is? So most people are like, Oh, well I scan 90% of 70%. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but so that would be the first approach is yes, get horizontal. Now with the way ServiceNow works, a lot of fundamentals in CDM are also, I'm gonna pick one tool for my master device record. I'm picking Big Fix. I'm picking Forescout. It doesn't have to be that way with ServiceNow. We use a uh, multi-aware CMDB and we have service graph connectors, which you know they can connect to the Big Fix, the SCCM, the Tenables, the Taniums, the, all those data sets. If they're in nooks and crannies of your network and they keep feeding into service now, here's another horizontal asset that I know about and you can trust, you can really get your horizontal assets collected. But then you do need vulnerability and configuration compliance. So you got to be bringing those in because that's that's the complete master device record. I think that's definitely the thing. Um, mapping and the, you know, what you call it, the index and have We haven't, DJ had to do that for the one customer, but all of our data is going to be in the same place. It doesn't matter which vulnerability scanner you use. We're going to put the data as a vulnerable item record in that table. So when you have to roll that back to the asset, the asset's always going to be as the core CI in the CMDB. It depends on how, how strong that asset is. Is it just a computer or do we know it's a server? That's when you get more into the service graph connectors. They, they get a little better of just, you know, what an asset is, but we automatically map. If you're using one of the service now or store integrations for this is my vulnerability scanner, it's going to say, do you have the asset? Do you want me to add the asset? So I can store the vulnerabilities against that asset. Then it's just a matter of saying, what does CDM want from that, you know, and mapping the, do they want serial number off the asset? Do they want, what do they want off of it? Okay. Um, for Slump, you know, that's, there's a confidence rating that you're given. Are you guys using that model to get a confidence rating of that CI? So therefore you're confirming it's not a good fit. I use an IP phone as a good example. IP phone, IP base, not going anywhere. It doesn't need to qualify the main name. But yet they require it. You know, just give a confidence rating that we as an agency can say, no, we're going to operate that. We're fine with just the IP phone with the IP address and that. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Um, 
So it's kind of two pieces there. Um, one is when we bring some of the service graph and IRE, which is our reconciliation engine, that's really where our confidence rating lives on is this a new asset, a different asset, or two things, four things, 10 things telling me about the same asset. That's really what the re uh, reconciliation engine is supposed to do. When things come in, who is more of your authoritative source on that? Is it, if, if I have discovery information and we've actually used a ServiceNow tool to go out and really dig into and interrogate that system and we brought back the information and populated a, an asset, a CI, or, and then Tenable comes in and it barely gets the host name. It can't really interrogate it because it doesn't know what questions to ask. Then we'll append it with the Tenable data that's uh, extra, right? That That's not there, but we'll maintain the the discovery information that's more authoritative. As you bring in more and more sources, we'll have authoritative CIs in that. They, we also leave the ones that you don't have confidence in, in what we call a discovered items table. So these are things that we're not gonna make a CI yet because it could be DHCP on a one hour VPN. And I don't wanna just add those to the CMDB and CIs. So we'll, we'll have that structure of what you do consider. So and I'd have to look more into this, but it may be one of those things where you say, yes, I just want to roll up my, my assets, or do I want to roll up my actual assets and some of my discovered items, which I haven't really in my CMDB said is a finite asset yet. That would be up to you, which layer of our data you wanted to push up. I heard you say, this is my issue with the certain sound. No, bring it, bring it. <laughs> Correct. I think I want to hear you say it's critical to the success of this, as we all know. So if you're saying we've gotten past, we've gotten past that, I think that's important for everyone out here because at an earlier day, we weren't having that conversation. We were saying the only way you can populate this is with discovery. So that's why I want to make sure you answer that one. You know what I'm talking about. Right? Yep. And it's, and it's because it's a multi aware CMDB now. Um, one of the root problems was that a lot of partners made their integrations for their tool. You have an agent on a box. You, you got enough credentials and access to say, I have an asset and I'm gonna tell ServiceNow that this is what I know about an asset. But they might not have mapped or been completely trained on what data. So they put 80% of their data in there and 10%, which is supposed to stay where everybody else is putting it, they're putting it in random spots. Oh, I got a UUID, I'm gonna make a random UUID field or I'm gonna make a random field for this. Um, and the store certification problem, uh, the way we certify store apps is just making sure that it's not going to break service now and it's not malware. But then we came up with the service graph connectors. Those go one level beyond, it's not just gonna break and be malware on our integration layer. What they say is let's check the data structure to make sure that it matches the CMDB, won't corrupt the CMDB and that they're putting all of their data in the right places in the CMDB. Now everybody's talking the same tables. It doesn't matter if it's SCCM service graph or big fix or Tanium service graph connector. Everybody who's certified to a service graph connector says that that integration will put the data in the right place as an authoritative asset source. And then you pick which one of those in IRE you want to be the most authoritative if it, depending on what data it gets you. But yeah, before service graph connectors though, it, there was enough of a deviation in a lot of these applications that would say, eh, it's not quite, you might as well just do a spreadsheet, right? Like you, you can mess it up any worse than a lot of these integrations. But now that they're certified on data structure, it's a lot different in getting horizontal. Cool. Well, I got five. I got one other question. I, I thought there was another question over here, wasn't there? Well, I guess not. No, anybody else have any other questions? Or are you totally open to come see us? We'll sit down, we'll have a longer conversation. We'll dive more into the technicals. I know I'm gonna go see you soon. Um, but anybody else have any other questions? Ben and I will hang around here yeah. afterwards if you wanna come up and talk. I, I also, as I mentioned before, recommend stopping by CGI's booth, see what they've done uh, on their system there. And uh, we appreciate everybody stopping in today. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Al.